Ruha Ahmed is currently employed as a marketing graduate intern at CNN International Commercial under the esteemed umbrella of Warner Bros. Discovery. Originally from the Maldives, Ruha spent a significant portion of her life in Malaysia before relocating to the UK to pursue higher education. After completing a foundation year in media studies, she embarked on her undergraduate degree in BA film based in London. In 2020, when the global pandemic emerged, Luha returned to Malé, the capital city of the Maldives. During this time, she successfully completed her second and final year of university, along with her final year project, a captivating short documentary shedding light on Malé and its local life. Following the completion of her studies, Luha ventured back to London seeking employment opportunities and soon joined a real estate company where she excelled in producing property tours and creating engaging social media content. Subsequently, in 2022, she commenced her internship at CNN, where she presently holds a position in the trade marketing department. Tune into this episode to delve deeper into the wonders of Maldives and its capital city, Malé. Gain inspiration from Luha's courageous journey of traversing continents, motivating yourself to embrace challenges and embarking on personal growth. Enjoy! Hello, Luha. Thank you for joining us today and to welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Can you please try to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. So, my name is Luha. I'm originally from the Maldives. But I eventually moved to Malaysia when I was about two years old and lived there for about 15 years before I moved to the UK. And that's where I guess my journey into this industry and everything sort of began. I studied media and film ever since I moved here. So I sort of stayed on the same wavelength in terms of what my interests are. And yeah. That's very really interesting. I've never met anyone from Maldives or Malaysia. I've actually never met another Maldivian here in the UK, like for like family. But there's definitely a lot of Malaysians for sure and Singaporeans. And for someone who maybe doesn't know where Maldives are, can you tell us where it is located? So it's a South Asian country. It's right by Sri Lanka and India and also quite close to Malaysia as well. It's about a four hour flight, hence why we moved to somewhere that was nearby when I was a kid. And it's a very, very small country. I couldn't give you the exact population now because it is growing, but I would say I'm from the capital, which is called Male, and it's right in the center. And if you look at it on the map, it's basically a bunch of atolls, they're called, that are sort of like dispersed vertically and the capital's right in the center and you could walk around pretty quickly like it's really not a big island but obviously i mean for most people that know the maldives they see it as like a holiday destination (laughs) so it's like you know all the beaches and resorts and whenever i say i'm from the maldives it's always like well like why did you move here why did you stay there but local life is, is very different It definitely also depends on your family background and if you are privileged enough to even have the opportunity to move and study abroad and things like that. So I actually worked on this short documentary about the Maldives and the capital Mm -hmm. and where I'm from in my final year of uni when everything was online. So yeah, I'll share that with you. But that itself was also like... A massive challenge because obviously COVID was very unexpected and given mm-hmm. film is a very practical course. I had like about a year and a half of it completely online so yeah. I sort of had to make do and figure it all out. I started in 2018 so COVID happened in my second year. But <laughs> then at least the third year was normal or kind of normal right? So it did get better. Like I know there were groups that were able to shoot in person. Obviously, there were so many restrictions and you know how we have to get everything greenlit. It was a lot more restrictive in terms of what they were allowing us to film and do, of course. So 
I remember I decided to go back to the Maldives right before the lockdown happened because I just I didn't want to be stuck here alone and like you know be away from my family like no one really knew what was going on so Mm -hmm. I flew back finished the rest of my second year and then when third year began we were still online and everyone was in their respective countries or still in the UK and we basically had to make the decision on what we wanted to do for our final year films of course which we kind of had already started working on me and my team we were very ambitious in terms of what we wanted to film so it was a risk in itself to go ahead with the idea and in the end sort of like the further along we went in like preparing for it just you know like our dop and producer and people on the team were you know a bit unsure of like how realistic this was in terms of carrying it out not everyone was also in the country so we were going to be flying back in and so we just made sort of like the collective decision to let go of that project that we'd been working on and do our own thing so that's how i ended up working on the documentary that was set in the maldives set in the capital and basically I had a huge family, a lot of cousins, so I got all of them to, like, help (laughs) me be my little production team. I, like, made them follow me around everywhere with equipment, and I made it work. It was fun. I It was a very different experience. I didn't have all the equipment that I wanted, and I just kind of had to make do. Yeah, I just wanted to really explore the one question that everyone would ask me when they asked like oh you know like the Maldives and why did you move and and so I wanted to dive into sort of the lifestyles and the different backgrounds and the different classes that you see in the capital and in conditions some people are more fortunate where you know there are people that are definitely struggling to make a living in the capital so It's very interesting. I got to interview quite a few different people and I did the best that I could and I managed to get something done out of it. But I still do have like a longer version that I have yet to finish. But life happened and I'm working full time. So Are you still planning to finish it? Yes, of course. I have to because there's like people that I interviewed that deserve to be heard. So How long was the version that you submitted and how long will be the version that you plan to make? I think the one that I submitted might have been just under 10 minutes. And then once it's completed, I would say at least half an hour. Not super long, but just enough to, you know, it'd be like a short documentary. To me, it sounds like really interesting topic for the documentary because as I said there aren't many people or I haven't met anyone from Maldives so it's something that people just don't know about so I would be curious to watch it and find out more because I'm not gonna lie my question was if Maldives are like this beautiful tourist destination where people just fly to the beaches you know for swimming in the sea and as you said I didn't probably realize it or you don't think about it that way that obviously there are different uh... yeah there's always two sides yeah Yeah. I mean I would say like I'm very fortunate to like when I go home go to the beach and have that kind of nature around me Mm -hmm. but for example when I first started working on the project I had a lot of mixed opinions from like the older generation versus the younger generation in my family because I would say with the Maldives the tourism industry is like the reason why you know we generated the wealth and has been able to develop the country in general even though it's not exactly you know to a standard that some people would have hoped it to be mm-hmm. but you know, there have been massive changes that have happened across the years because of tourism that's been generated but At the same time, I think, like I said, there's this whole other side that no one knows about that Mm -hmm. is shown online or you don't see it in ads. But I understand that because 
that generation, like my father's generation, their work, their whole lives to promote this like sunny side of life. So yeah, I mean, there's pros and cons to it. With working on the documentary, I was doing my best not to be sort of biased as well, because I think especially given I didn't grow up there, I would visit every single year, but it's important that I'm able to have almost like no opinion in terms of like when I'm editing as well and just give the facts as it is and so that it's more objective rather than subjective, yeah right? exactly exactly so with the people that I interviewed as well they were from different classes and different backgrounds different walks of life so yeah and then with the COVID I assume that the whole country must have been impacted since people couldn't travel as much and tourism yeah. is or was the high source of revenue for the country so was like the country impacted a lot by that yeah. 100 i mean that being like the main source of revenue i think i don't know i believe like there were a lot of resorts that may have had to close down for a bit people not been able to maintain certain hotels so it definitely the hit was hard But I think as soon as the country opened back up, sort of went back to normal. But I mean, I don't have like a huge like understanding on specifics in terms of what may have happened. But I definitely was aware of that being like a huge downfall during mm-hmm. that time. But all is well now. And out of curiosity, how expensive is it there for tourists? Is it cheap or expensive? So it depends on what kind of holiday you want to have. I think most people assume that you can only go there if you're planning to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. A five-star hotel. Yeah, but there's actually ways to enjoy the country on a budget. I would say it's probably the flight ticket that's going to be expensive given where you're coming from because unless you're flying in from like a bordering country... It's not going to be as cheap, but there's this thing called guest houses in the Maldives. So they're not on their own individual island. So if you're going to the Maldives for a five-star luxury holiday, the minute you land, you'll have, you know, someone from the hotel that has come to the airport to pick you up mm-hmm. and take you to your car. And if you're taking a speedboat, you'll get onto your speedboat and drive you know like <laughs> all the way to the resort or they'll take you to your air taxi so that's another thing if your island or your resort is further away from the capital you have to take like this small little plane that lands in the sea which is like another experience very fun and cool and i mean depends on what you're into some people might find it scary oh, it sounds cool. great but i can imagine this is like for some millionaires or like proper expensive one i mean you definitely have to save up For sure, for that kind of an experience. But yeah, so that in itself, once you get to the resort, you have everything there. So it's just like any other hotel. You have your restaurants with buffets and you have your villas or your overwater villas. It's like all inclusive. Yeah, everything's there on one island. Some people say, you know, it really depends on what kind of a person you are. If you prefer to do more activities and be more adventurous on a holiday you have to be very selective in terms of the resort that you choose because i feel like majority of people that go to the maldives just want to relax so the minute they land they're just by the beach tanning <laughs> or reading a book and you know going for their meals and it's mm-hmm. just repeat and doing like a few water sports here and there but yeah you're not going to be you know climbing mountains anywhere or i don't know, I guess it's not really for like an adrenaline junkie, but I think the snorkeling and the diving is like a huge thing as well in the Maldives. So mm-hmm. a lot of people go there to surf as well. But yeah, that's that one side of like super expensive kind of a holiday. And then there's also the other side where they have the guest houses and they're built differently. So it's like you'll have these three, four-story small buildings with, you know, rooms, basically a small hotel. But they're usually located on a local island. So when you visit the island, you'll have people 
like actual locals living around you and it's a completely different experience whereas in a resort you probably wouldn't see anyone from the Maldives except for the staff probably yeah. or any other Maldivians that are at the resort for their holiday yeah so if you go to a guest house it is a lot more cheaper obviously your experience is completely different but I would say you have the opportunity to try more local food, hear the language, get to know people from the Maldives. Some of them are super welcoming in terms of inviting you to their home and like cooking their dishes for you, which mm -hmm. you would experience at a resort. But I would say, I mean, if you're fortunate enough to like definitely try to experience both because as different as they are, it's still special in their own ways. Yeah, I understand. It will be maybe sounds like if you go to Airbnb and stay in someone's place. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on the guest house, I would say. But the guest houses themselves, they still sort of operate the same way as a hotel. So you'll have other guests staying there as well. It's like you're on a local island and you see the homes and, you know, the beach is different. And you mentioned language. What language is spoken there? Yeah, so the local language is called Divehi, which is not very popular at all. <laughs> so, I mean, I think to a foreigner, if you were listening to the language, it would basically sound like any other South Asian language. So there's influences from like Sinhalese, Hindi, a little bit of Arabic. It's a mix of a couple of different things, but I think any other South Asian language is it's influenced by. And I would say, obviously, we also have other dialects. So if you go to an island that's further away from the capital, you know, they speak differently. I wouldn't be able to understand. So, oh, so it's, it's so different. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think my mom would be able to, but it's the way they pronounce certain words, completely different. What was the level of English? Is it because of tourists higher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say like it's taught in all the schools, whether international or public school. Pretty much everyone knows how to speak English. I think if you go to a local island, the fluency may vary. But like you said, because of the tourism industry and people that are coming into the country from so many different backgrounds, it's pretty important that you're able to speak English. But also there are a lot of people that work in the Maldives now that are from countries that most of the guests are from. So you'll see a lot of Italians or Filipinos, um, Indians. And yeah, it sort of like helps them feel a lot more welcomed. I think, of course, seeing people from similar backgrounds when they can just speak and ask questions without being misinterpreted. So that's really helpful. And yeah, it's definitely changed a lot. And the demographic in terms of people that visit the country, I feel like has changed over the years as well, which is just interesting. It sounds definitely like a beautiful destination or interesting one to visit. Yeah, you should like 100% visit one day. How many hours is the flight from London? So I've taken a direct flight once and I believe that might have been over 10 hours and I personally will never take a direct flight again so whenever <laughs> I go back I just have to walk and like stand I just I can't so oh. when I have been back ever since I moved here I always take two flights so I do my transit in Dubai so from here to Dubai is about five to six hours a little bit more give or take and then from Dubai to Maldives is about four to five hours. It takes kind of like a whole day, depending on how long your transit is. Mm -hmm. But I would recommend trying to land in the Maldives in the morning if you're going for your holiday, just so you can make the most of the day as soon as you land. And yeah, actually see the ocean and like, you know. Mm -hmm. Enjoy your time there. So what was the reason for you moving to Malaysia? definitely better quality of life and education so it was a huge sacrifice in general sort of moving away from all our extended family at the time i had one other cousin that had already moved to malaysia so that was pretty much the only other family we had there at the time but yeah my parents made the decision i just have an older brother so it was me and my older brother 
that moved with my mom to Malaysia and my dad continued working in the Maldives so he would visit us sort of like be back and forth and yeah I always wonder what life would have been like if I just grew up in the Maldives but Mm. I'm very very thankful that I had the experience of growing up in Malaysia because I had people from so many different backgrounds around me growing up I went to an international school so yeah I mean my closest friends I have Singaporean friend I have a lot of Malaysian friends I have people I remember in so many different backgrounds a lot of um, British expats tend to like move to Asian countries so when they move their children come into the schools as well and yeah. sorry was it also to capital which I believe is Kuala Lumpur yes correct I live in Kuala Lumpur and it's pretty big so I mean, compared to the capital in, <laughs> in all the years, basically. <laughs> so, I lived in this area called Kamantun for like my whole life. And I went to a school that wasn't really that close by. I had to take a bus to school and it would take at least 30 to 40 minutes by bus. But yeah, I went to the same school from year one until I graduated in year 11. So I grew up with the same people. So everyone kind of felt like we were siblings or something. Yeah, know. like a family. Yeah. I kept a pretty close group of friends. Like my closest friends today are the friends that I made in Malaysia, pretty mm. much. What do you call your home now? Do you call home Maldives or <laughs> Malaysia? That's the biggest question. I could make a documentary of this question. <laughs> I think... You know, I haven't been back to Malaysia in about, I think, three years now, which is a while and I really miss it. I think the older I get, because both my parents now live in the Maldives, and I think home is wherever your family is, at least for me. So I do feel like the Maldives is more home, but nothing compares to when I land in Malaysia and I hear the language again and I smell the food and just the tiny little things the difference in the air and the places that I used to go to as a kid it's also home but in a different kind of way I guess I have more than two homes no it's understandable yeah. considering how much time you spend there and it was your childhood so it must be hard to say and both played a big role in your life yeah for sure in very different ways. Yeah. And then I guess I eventually moved here when I was 17. And I came here for a foundation year. I went to a college for international students in Brighton. Super Mm -hmm. random, but that's what I did. So I lived in Brighton for like a year when I was 17. And I went to this college but it's um, another beautiful city, isn't it? Yeah, no. Just well, by the sea. It was great because I could just walk down to the pier after yeah. my classes and be by the beach. Very different kind of beach to the Maldives, but still a beach. Is uh, in Maldives is it like rather sand and palm? Yeah, in Brighton it's more of like a pebbled beach, I would say. But yeah, I would say given Brighton's like a smaller city of London obviously there wasn't as many places to go to it like started getting very repetitive but I think for a year it was a good experience I would say I kind of was like a boarding school pretty much I lived on campus so when I was on campus I didn't really feel like I was in the UK because there were people from Malaysia Thailand Iran I sort of just didn't really click until I would go out and like have to run my errands and, you know, start my independent yeah. life, pretty much. I did have a culture shock when I first moved here with, like, food and, of course, the weather. Because I pretty much grew up under, like, the heat of the sun my whole life. And I came here. And why did you pick Brighton? Why not London in the first place? So I think when I finished school in Malaysia, I pretty much knew I wanted to do something related to digital media in general. But at the same time, I was sort of figuring out whether or not I wanted to do another two to three years of like 
A levels, or mm-hmm. if I could basically take a shortcut and do a foundation year and go straight to uni, which is what I did. And in Malaysia, they didn't really have as many subjects that I would have been interested in doing in my A levels in terms of like being more creative and things like that. So I remember I went to one student fair and I came across the stall that were promoting this college and they did have a campus in London as well. But I think the one in Brighton was a lot more safe, especially at the age that I was going to move away from my family and you know everything being on campus just seemed a little bit more preferable at the time I didn't really have a major understand like I knew like everyone you know knows of London Uh but I didn't necessarily like have a preference I knew that Brighton was super close I have an older cousin that also moved here around the same time so she was already here by the time I moved but in London so I could like visit her but yeah I mean it sort of just happened that way and that particular campus was Mm -hmm. more suitable and I just wonder how come that Brighton was present in their uni in Malaysia so far away (laughs) how is it possible or why I think because they're like specifically catering towards international students Mm -hmm. so yeah like I said there are a lot of Malaysians that went to this particular college as well. So yeah, that's probably why they were this student fair. Of course, there were other unis as well, but yeah. And weren't you also thinking about the different countries? That, I would okay. so. I think most students from the region that I grew up in, and even in the Maldives, once you graduate for your higher education in general, it's like either the UK the US, Australia, New Zealand, those are like the main countries. My parents would have never let me go all the way to the US, so way too far away. And I also would have been like, okay, maybe that's a bit too far. So I never really considered. And I think when it came to Australia in general, I didn't have any friends or anyone that I knew that was planning to go there at the time. Now I do have very close friends that live there, but I don't know. Nothing really stood out to me. Also, just knowing I had one cousin here made the big difference. And yeah. Yeah, it's understandable. It makes sense. Just a quick one. If you enjoy our podcast, please give us a review on your favorite podcast app, subscribe or share it with your friends. For more information, visit the show notes. Thank you and back to the show. So how did you find the foundation here in Brighton? Did it meet your expectations? I didn't know what to expect, actually, when I first moved, I think. And sorry, can you just briefly say what did you actually study before in Malaysia? In Malaysia, so it's based on a British curriculum. So we did the IGCSEs at the end. So we had our O levels and A levels. Mm -hmm. But at the time in my school, they weren't doing A levels. We stopped at O and then you had to go to a different school to complete your A and then go for uni. So pretty much our syllabus was according to the British curriculum. But our teachers were from everywhere. So we would have local teachers. We'd have British teachers, Americans. It's sort of like a huge mix as well in terms of like the people that were teaching us. In terms of the subjects, it's like the same things that you would study. So geography, maths, English. Yeah, so like in general, not focused yeah, on Yeah, it was pretty much general. And then towards the end, I think it's about five to seven different subjects for your O-levels. I don't remember anymore. The only creative thing that I could do was art and design. And yeah, everything else was your standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. So how was the foundation? Like I said, I didn't really know what to expect because I was moving away from my family for the first time. And I'd also never had to make new friends since I was like six years old. I grew up with the same people. I remember when I first went into the campus and my parents dropped me off and it was the last day that they were in the UK and did my goodbyes and I went back to my room and I just remember sitting in my bed thinking like, wow, I'm just here. I have a kid. I don't know how my parents let me do that. And just thinking like, I need to go and make a friend. 
And then I met this really lovely Iranian girl. She was there to study English. So I very quickly became her friend that was helping her in terms of like improving her speech and the way that she would communicate. And it was, it was fun. Like everyone was there for different subjects, you know, and the foundation year in general. So I did media studies. It wasn't a really big class. I think there was maybe five of us in total, like very intimate, like we knew our teacher very well. And I think we had three different terms and we had exams at the end of each. But outside of our media studies class, we also had to do compulsory, I think, English and some life skills class and Uh like, you know, just your standard thing. But There was also something to do with computing. So there was like a couple other things on the side, but the main course that I was there to do, I really enjoyed it because it was the first time that I was able to focus my interests on one thing and not have to like really study anything else at the time. And yeah, it was the first time I was able to like really explore my capabilities and have the opportunity to use bigger equipment and like things I would have never gotten a hold of back home. And so was it both theoretical and practical? Yes, kind of half enough. So we got to work on, I remember doing like a music video and then I think we had to make like a small portfolio show reel of our work. So some editing work, we had to create some magazines at one point. So it was like a mix of different things, given it was not specifically to do with film, but rather yep. media in general. And then from there, I pretty much went back home. So I went back to, don't remember if I went, had gone back to Malaysia or the Maldives. I remember my mom had not permanently moved back to the Maldives just yet at the time. But I remember I had to very quickly start applying for my visa to come back and it's like a very long procedure so i actually was probably would have started in the same year that you did Mm -hmm. but i didn't get my visa on time i had to defer one year for that year i was pretty much in the maldives just sort of like doing random things and like preparing to move to the uk eventually so i had a little break in between uni at least now it must have been much easier to move again, although to a different city, but at least you tried before, so it wasn't so new and so scary. Yeah, but funnily enough, I was a lot more emotional when I moved for uni, even though I was older and, <laughs> and I like had already been here. Because when I moved for that foundation year, I knew it was just a year and I was going to see my family again. But then moving for uni, I was like, okay, this is like a three-year thing. It's set, you know, anything could happen. And London is obviously still quite different to a small place like Brighton. So I had visited before when I was in Brighton as well, but living here is so different. I've gotten so used to it now, but back then I was definitely overwhelmed. (laughs) I'm not surprised. (laughs) I was as well when I moved here, so... It's understandable. Where did you move from? From Czech Republic. And I'm from a little town. So yeah. like just a few people in a town, like everyone knows everyone. And then I moved yeah. to London, which is just a little lower population than the whole country. So it's yeah. crazy. And did you know that you wanted to go to study to London after you finished in Brighton? Yeah. So we basically had to start our UCAS applications during our course. So like we had classes or specific guidelines in terms of like helping us make our applications when I was in college. And so I remember at the time my tutors, they put a lot of emphasis on like going for open days. So I'd actually applied to, I think, Leeds and Manchester and a couple other cities as well. But I kind of knew I wanted to be in London just because it was 
where my cousin was as well, a capital. And, and then, also probably the best place for film industry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it kind of just made sense. I went to an open day in Greenwich University. And then like shortly after I went to the open day at Middlesex. And I remember I went to this short introductory session and I was sold. I remember thinking, okay, Kendon's not in central, like it's not super close to central London, but the campus was nice and facilities were great. And I think at the time, like, I don't know what the ranking is now, but I just remember that particular course was ranked pretty high at the time. And yeah, that's how London came to be. And I was always sort of leaning towards London in general. <laughs> but with the ranking, as you mentioned, I remember the same that I heard it, that it was ranked very high. And actually, when I spoke to some other people about the reason why they chose Middlesex, they also said that Middlesex was ranking really high. I don't know if it was only in London or in the whole country, but must have been true. And it persuaded a lot of people. Yeah, I think it was like the whole of UK. Yeah, which is impressive. Yeah. And once studying, did you feel like that foundation year was helpful, that it gave you like some foundation to start with? Yeah, I mean, I would say like just having the experience of using bigger equipment, you know, directing smaller projects, even if it was a team of like three people, still made a big difference. So I think... I had better understanding of the practical side of things. And given, you know, it is a very hands-on course, it definitely helped. Would I have maybe done A-levels instead? I think maybe if I had the opportunity to study other subjects more relating to what I wanted to do, I might have. But yeah, I don't necessarily regret it. I think I did it like in a year and I qualified me to go to uni. So that was the aim. And I was very sure of what I wanted to do. I feel like I've just always been very creative. Like my mom's super creative. My grandfather's used to paint and draw. and So it's in your genes. Yeah, it's in my genes. (laughs) But yeah, I just remember like how I very specifically got into the idea of like film in general was I got my first laptop when I was about I think 11, 12 years old and it had the webcam on the front and I just remember using that camera to like start filming things. So with I would laptop. Hold, yeah, that's <laughs> with my laptop. So I would like hold up my laptop and like go around and like <laughs> film shop and then I yeah. take this laptop back to the Maldives so this is when I was living in Malaysia mm-hmm. and I force all my little baby cousins to be actors for me and I like made a whole horror film and like use a little, little editing system yeah. and then I would invite people to like watch the film in my mm-hmm. living room I think I just never got tired of it I always found it fun and interesting. So I feel like, you know what? Also, I think I'm just very very fortunate enough to have had the opportunity to actually choose what I wanted to study. I know a lot of my cousins or just even close friends that sort of have this set out from like what their parents may have wanted them to do. Especially coming from my background, like being South Asian, most people would expect you you know go into like engineering or you know Um, law and medicine but i genuinely never had an interest in that field the only other thing i i did sort of always find interesting was i think criminology or forensic science because i watch a lot of crime documentaries uh, and i was like you know i don't know if that's the way to go so i just left it and did you also know what role did you want to focus on like specifically to do with like editing or stuff yes. or things like that. I think when I joined uni, I had already done a lot of editing work in general because in school, I would edit a lot of work for like the different events that would happen, presentations and things like that. So I used like Final Cut Pro and that's pretty much 
what I was the most familiar with. And by the time I got to Middlesex, I think I wanted to sort of continue forward in that field of editing. I prefer being behind the camera rather than in front. So that's where my head was at. But I don't know if it was in the first or second year, I made the decision to direct something just to like see if I could do it, push myself and like, you know, go out the box a little bit. And I think I did well. And I felt like as challenging as it was, I found it very interesting to like just go through the whole process of working on the storyboards and like drawing everything out to casting the actors and just everything in general. Having that experience, I knew that, you know, I was able to do other roles as well. But I would say directing and editing was what I ended up specializing in towards the end in the final year. So did you, in the final year for the final project, did you focus on... Oh yeah, you did both because... So basically, in our second year, we also were meant to do short film, but that got cancelled immediately because of COVID. And that short film was the same film that we picked up to complete in our final year. That's what we wanted to work on, me and my team. And my role in that was to direct and edit. And then in my final year, when everything was online, I sort of did everything. I mean, I had my kids to help me, you know, hold the microphone or like hold the camera in place, things like that. But yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, because we spoke about it before, as you were filming the documentary, where did you get all the equipment or so, how did you go about it? So one of my cousins, her dad had a camera. I think it was a Canon, just a regular DSLR camera, but the quality was great. He had like a huge lens and I borrowed that camera and the same cousin had a friend that had sound equipment so not like anything too fancy it was just one of those clip-on mics and then I think had another cousin that had a small <laughs> GoPro so my cousins sourced the no I see as you mentioned before you have a big family back then family. so it was really helpful yes it came in clutch the only thing I used for myself was my laptop to edit and that was pretty much it I hadn't brought anything else with me. No, it's great that you still managed. Yeah. That you had the resources, equipment, and sounds good. Yeah. I'm very lucky to have completed that. So I didn't really want to just write something or... No, it uh, makes sense. Yeah. I wanted to do something practical. So how was it after the university? How did you start your entry into the industry? So I remember I had started interviewing for roles during my final year and obviously given I was in the Maldives like it was very difficult in terms of visas and things because obviously you're no longer on a student visa and for myself it was either I applied to the graduate visa that had come out at the time which is like a two-year thing or you just get sponsored to work as like a skilled worker here right and at the time, given like just the experience that I had, which wasn't much, it was just uni and I did like a small placement in between, I felt like the likelihood of me getting sponsored to work in the UK might have been very small. So I basically took the big risk of flying back here without a job guaranteed to apply for the graduate visa because you like have to be in the country to apply for it, I think. So I flew back in 2021, I believe, and it was the end of 2021. I came back, I applied for the visa, and then I was pretty much on the hunt for jobs. I had to find a way to live here. So I ended up picking up an opportunity that I wouldn't have expected to be in so for the first year of the graduate visa i pretty much worked doing content for an estate agency in north london 
So they had no creative department or like marketing or anyone doing things for their social media. And so, you know, I thought it was an interesting opportunity, but I was like, I can't be picky and I could have to take whatever I get. So I remember I had one phone call and then they asked me to come into their office. And so I went, they're based like all the way up in Cock Fosters, which is like the end of the Piccadilly line. So it was uh-huh. all about like an hour away from where I lived at the time. But I went in and yeah, I just shared my portfolio. They asked a couple of questions and pretty much my role there was majority of it was filming for their tours. So their property tours. And that honestly was quite fun because I want to see a lot of different houses. And my manager at the time, he pretty much like sourced and bought all the equipment. I just gave a list of like everything. (laughs) You could have picked anything you wanted expensive and they was good. I pretty much did. So, (laughs) I mean, I had my camera, so we stuck with that. And then I think we needed to get like a gimbal. So that was like a DJI gimbal. And then he got the sound equipment as well. And then I believe we may have gotten like some lighting things as well. And also like subscribing to the Adobe softwares and all those different things. But I was very clear in a sense that I didn't have anything on me. So the only way I could work for them is if they provided provided, it. I clearly did and I was kind of like a one woman show I did all like filming the editing and everything so it was quite tiring but I was able to also work from home because I was editing most of the time but I also did small things on the side like some graphic design work for like their email signatures other social media posts yeah the content in general it actually wasn't just property tours. Given they're based in North London, you know, you want to promote the area as well for their clients. And they had offices for different areas. So we would go and sort of like contact small businesses in certain areas, make little promo videos for them, which was really fun. So we made one for a bakery, for a gym, for an art gallery. So yeah. there's always something new and different, which was also nice. And yeah, I ended up staying there for about 10 months, I think. I mean, I could have completed my two years there, but I think I really wanted to just challenge myself. I was doing what I already knew how to do. And I want to just always push myself to do more and to learn. So I knew that eventually I would have to see what else was out there. And so, yeah, I started interviewing for the graduate internships that Warner Media had put out. And I'd actually interviewed with them before I'd come to the UK, but I didn't have the visa. So it was really difficult. And they had quite a few rounds. So I'd made it to like towards the end and then just oh. flopped because it wasn't in the UK and I like didn't have the visa. So that's why I was like, you know what? To even really get a shot at things, I need to just take the risk, which is what I did. And so, yeah, I decided to interview with them again, but for a different role. And they didn't have that many practical positions for the graduate internship. So my focus was rather to just go into something where I knew I could still apply my skills and just making sure that the team had some sort of connection in terms of like working with other teams that may be more production based you know just knowing i could work with other people even if i'm not working directly in the same teams and being able to learn was the biggest thing for me and i think it's just getting your foot in the door is a huge blessing so so what was the role so the role is for marketing graduate internship which is what what i'm doing now it is warner bros right yeah, so technically, Warner Brothers Discovery and Warner Media, it's like they sort of have a bunch of different other companies under them. So yeah. I work under CNN International Commercial, and then there's also Cartoon Network, and there's also TNT, 
and discovery. So there's a lot of different departments and people and teams, and we all sort of are under the same umbrella. And so I knew I was interviewing for CNN and the International Commercial Department. Basically, there's a lot of different teams from like sales to finance, legal, marketing, PR. But I would say in my role in particular, I pretty much what I do, I would say it's divided into internal and external communications. So most of the work that I do on a day-to-day basis is internal. So that's from editing newsletters. So I do a lot of writing actually. So there's newsletters that go out weekly. So I have to sort of put those together and it's to update everyone in the teams of like the latest events, any upcoming seminars, webinars, anything that's gone on like a magazine or an article and things like that pretty much. And there's a couple other newsletters as well that go out. And then other than that, I have to assist with like updating. So a lot of administrative stuff as well, like updating their systems, their intranet, putting things onto their website, updating their website, and kind of a handful of things. And then the external work that I do is the social media and their commercial website. And there's also a newsletter that goes out to their clients. But I would say what I'm most grateful for, especially in this role as my manager, she's sort of been very accommodating in terms of making sure that when each graduate comes in, I think just really understanding their background and what they studied and where their skill set lies the best. So I have been able to like edit a lot of work for bigger events and like other countries and have that, you know, on my portfolio, (laughs) things Uh like that. And then also with the social media accounts in general. So CNN actually has an in-house brand studio, like a production company within. So they don't, I mean, they do source externally as well, I would say, but with CNN, I see they have their own little team inside to do everything. So I pretty much handle that team's social media so whenever they have any recent launches that they've worked on if it's a sponsored film or a sponsored content site i get to sort of take that on board and i think the biggest project that i've sort of managed in this role because i'm actually almost done this august will be a year Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah so my sort of task i would say was to revamp and like given you look and feel to their social media accounts because they were sort of just reposting content as it came but i was like you know let's make this look a little bit more interactive so <laughs> to work with that team and their designers so in that sense i think depending on your skill set they're very accommodating and like actually allowing you to do things that you can put onto your cv and enjoy and uh-huh. uh, that I know the intern before me, she enjoyed doing more writing as well. So she got to work on the website and like updating their website. So it really depends. But yeah. And can you say, or do you want to say what is their social media called? For example, Instagram yeah. or Facebook, um, so that we can have a look at their work? Yes, of course. So I think it's just create on Instagram. I will then put it to the show notes if someone wanted to have a look. It's CNN Creates. So it actually took a while to get everything sort of approved. So I think like only a couple of weeks ago did we start implementing the different sort of look and feel and vibe that we were going for. So yeah, there's not too many posts, but good number enough to see, I guess, what I've done now. We'll have a look afterwards. I was thinking if you want people to follow you, or do you want to share to follow your work or even yourself, your social media or website or something? You know what? Why not LinkedIn? I think that's the best place. So I have my LinkedIn. I think it's just my name. So Luha Ahmed, L-U-H-A-H-M-E-T. You can find my portfolio website and social media and everything on there. 
So. And do you know what are your plans when you finish this internship? I'm currently very deep into the job hunt right now for my mm-hmm. journal. I think my aim is sort of just to still stay within the media industry, but I really wanted to sort of work in teams where I can work on new content constantly rather than like a feature length film. So I figured that out when I was in uni that I didn't see myself going into like the bigger film industry. So I'm looking into a lot of like production based roles, but also roles that might be a little bit more to do with project management. But yeah, it's very much varied. I think as long as I can apply my skill set, that's sort of the aim right now. (laughs) Yeah, I'll see what happens. And hoping for the best. Yeah, yeah. fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we'll find something that we'll enjoy and we'll be able to, you know, develop yourself creatively and express yourself. Yes. So, yeah, thank you very much, Luha. I will get in touch and wish you good luck in the meantime. You too. And I look forward to the rest of the series and podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Produce by. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app, leave a review or send us your feedback. For more information about the host, links from the episode and ways to connect with us, visit the show notes. If you know someone who would be an ideal guest for our podcast, please get in touch. Thank you and see you soon.